Anyway, so the, the, the request was for me to cover uh, some lectures in numer numerical relativity. Uh, so I have the first two lectures prepared. The last two lectures will depend on, on the audience and what you guys want. Uh, checking the, the uh, posters, I see uh, some of you are working in quite advanced questions, so uh, will depend on where we talk it, uh, take it. But I was gonna ask for a show of hands, so I could focus the last two lectures into questions of, say, either applications of numerical relativity in ads -CFT. that's one option. Another option is more on astrophysics. And a third option is related to what you've been hearing, for instance, from Claudia, beyond GR. So let's say if I call ads -CFT one Astro2, beyond GR, so who cares about one? Okay, how about two? Oh, shit, how about three? <laughs> okay, so we're about the same. So I will try to uh, show you a little bit of everything. We'll, we'll see where we go on that. Um, okay, so now another show of hands. How many of you know about the Fermi pasta Ulam problem? Okay, cool. So, and actually, nowadays, it's, it's better known as Fermi pasta Ulam single problem. So I'll tell you the story of the Fermi pasta Ulam problem, Fermi pasta Ulam single problem, uh, just to set the stage. Imagine mid 1950s, the first computers were getting uh, to be available. Of course, usually they were in some facility that was thinking more about nuclear weapons than anything, than anything else. But here comes Fermi uh, with collaborators Passa and Ulam and ask the following question. Suppose you have a collection of N harmonic oscillators. They are coupled. So imagine you have some two walls and put a series of harmonic oscillators, of, of springs, all identical, and ask the question, how will a system, if I now add to it some small nonlinearity, so imagine that now your equations of motion for that system, say for the oscillator j, with some kind of numbering one through n, well, let's say it's gonna be min minus chi, x, xj minus xj minus one, minus k, say some constant, xj minus xj is plus one, so just measuring the departure from equilibrium. Um, you say, well, okay, what happens here? Uh, you have a simple set of harmonic oscillators you can solve for the normal modes of the problem, and then ask what this dynamic is. But what they say is, well, let's throw in some nonlinearity into the problem. So imagine you have the following, alpha, and now xj minus xj minus one, square minus xj minus xj plus one square. So let's throw that in. Let's, let's do these experiments. Out of the blue, I have no idea what it, why they were thinking about this. And alpha is a parameter, it's a small parameter. But it's nonlinear, so you expect it all through uh, just in your physics intuition. Now there's a nonlinear couple between coupling between the different springs. If I solve for the normal modes of the system, and I imagine that I excite one of those normal modes initially, if I wait long enough, the system should equilibrate, should get to a state where essentially all modes share the same amount of energy. And sure enough, they put that in the computer. The reason FPU, now T, single, is included is because she was the one, oh, there is an interesting side note here as to how much value uh, women were given at that time, but they were the main uh, people working with the computers. She was the one that put this into the, the numerical solution, and they investigated the system. And so they were looking at, say, the energy in the different modes of the system. They put energy into one mode. Let's call that whatever mode one. Some amount of energy, as time went by, this one came down. The other modes started growing, and they say, oh, this is what's going to happen the system will thermalize. All modes will have the same amount of energy. But then, one day, apparently the story goes, by mistake they let the problem go for much longer. And to their surprise, what happened, after a long time, the system went back to essentially its initial state. And so they call that recurrence. So somehow, even though for a while you seem to have distributed that initial energy into all modes, after a sufficiently long time, all the other modes went essentially to having zero energy, and all energy, with the exception of about 3%, came back to the first mode. 
And so there is this nice kind of side note by Fermi saying, oh, this could be interesting. So we're in the year 2022, almost 70 years after that, after that problem, and people are still arguing about what is behind the dynamics of the system, and it's just a very nonlinear phenomena that hinted of the existence of solitons and chaos that could only be uncovered through numerical simulations. So I, I typically uh, use kind of the terminology that uh, physics, as we know, is dynamics. I mean, the rest is kinematics and configurations that, sure, might be interesting. I can have the solution in Newtonian mechanics of a pen of thunder on its tip, but we know you wouldn't expect to enter a room and find in the pen like that because it's unstable. So asking what happened with the dynamics of a system is really asking what is the physics of the system. And up to some, let's say, arguably the 20th century, uh, the most we could do in general was linear RH approximations. But most of the interesting problems in physics are not linear in nature, and I'll, every now and then uh, we'll give you some examples. So there's Singu, or not Singu, Pasta. No, sorry, Stanislav, Stanislav Ulam has a quote that says, well, speaking about nonlinear science, it's like talking about the study of the bulk of zoology as a study of non-elephant animals. I, the linear calculations that we have been doing, or physicists have been doing for, for a long time, has been essentially studying the, the elephant. But there's a lot of interesting physics that only through the use of computers, technology, now, uh, thankfully, technology has, is catching up to our ambition. We can begin to ask deep questions. And as we do so, there are plenty of, of uh, examples that, of, of surprises that have come along. In general activity, perhaps the most, uh, the first surprise that came out is the Choptwick phenomena. Again, show of hands, how many of you know about Choptwick's phenomena? Critical phenomena in general activity? Cool, that's not that many. So just, let's imagine that this very, very simple question, you, you have flat space-time, we have Minkowski, you throw in, so let's start thinking now about this equation, you throw in some source, and you have, again, you're able to do your experiment, you make that source as weak as you can. You would expect that flat space-time is recovered. And this is a celebrated result in hardcore mathematics by Christoph Dullo and Kleinemann that actually show that. If you have an initial data that is very, very weakly uh, gravitating, eventually it will disperse away and give you back Minkowski. We also, on the other hand, we have singularity theorems that will tell us that if you focus, we have enough initial focusing power, you're going to form a black hole. Well, you're going to form a singularity, and hopefully if, if co cosmic censorship applies, you're going to form a black hole. But the question is, what happened at the middle? So what happened if you now begin to try to bracket that between either dispersing away back to flat space-time or forming a black hole? What is the smallest black hole you can form? What is the dynamics of the space-time as you get closer and closer to that critical parameter? And that's the question that Matt Choptek Choptek in the uh, mid-'80s started asking, working with his PhD thesis with Bill Unruh, and through a heck of a lot of very, very careful work, he established that at that very uh, critical point, a whole new set of things that were totally unexpected happened. First, you form an Aiken singularity, a singular, a black hole of zero mass. Second, the space-time behaves self-similar. So it repeats itself with a period that comes out of the blue. To this day, we don't know what that period is. And there was an echoing behavior of this space-time that is trying to decide where it's going to form a black hole or disperse away. And again, this was something that could only have been uncovered through numerical simulations. And so it used to be, and it's still very much an attitude of some, some people in the field, that if you are smart enough, uh, if you're tough enough, um, if you think hard, you don't need a computer. The reality is, I think, is that something else that is different, and this is a phrase by Choptwick. I said, well, with the right resources, the right attitude, and the right technology, you can simulate situations you couldn't even begin to think through, or you didn't even know they could exist, and thereby obtain a completely new and unexpected things to think about, which may require numerical, more numerical simulations or analytical work, regardless what you're doing is doing physics. So what we're going to try is make contact with that. 
We're going to be discussing these. Initially, I'm going to be thinking about more of the left-hand side. Then we're going to be talking a little bit about the issues that come out when you throw in the right-hand side. Or maybe as we go beyond GR, what are the kind of things you have to worry about uh, when this thing gets augmented by the corrections to general relativity? Um, but first, I'm going to go much, much basics uh, and then give you the, the initial tools because the temptation to do a computation numerically is something, as someone, uh, an author called J.P. Boyd, of which he, I'm going to uh, refer to him later, has a quote, an interesting quote that says, a computation is a temptation that should be resisted as much as possible. So be very careful before you jump into doing something with a, with a numerical simulation, because there are many things you could do that could lend, take you into the very wrong direction. And there are plenty of wrong results published in the literature that are a result of limitations of the knowledge uh, that goes back. So we'll, we'll go back and then try to make sure that we decide on a set of ground rules that we should follow before we can even begin trusting a simulation. So just a few references here. References here. There is, this is uh, uh, the link to a, an introduction to numerical relativity course that we taught at Primary Institute at different years with Matt Choptwick, Franz Pretorius, Scott Noble, and myself, with different combinations. There, we, there you'll have lots of uh, useful uh, things to draw from. I'll also refer to these two books as kind of, in some sense, the widest uh, uh, difference in the spectra. There is something called, and maybe you guys have seen it at some point, Numerical Recipes. There's a very, very common book that people use, and by all means, I will ask you to not do it until you know what you're doing. Because this is a Numerical Recipes. This is what they meant to. So it's like me to open a cookbook picking a recipe, and then do it. Sure, I'm going to perhaps do it right. That doesn't mean I know how to cook. So this is a very useful resource once you know what you're doing. At the other end of the spectra is this book called Time Dependent Problems and Different Methods by Gustav von Kreis and Oliger. I don't know Gustav von Oliger, but I knew Kreis. This is a guy that never wrote a computer code in his life. This is an applied mathematician who proved theorems. And this is the foundation for anything that is solid in applied mathematics and therefore also in numerical applications. So if you want to learn deeply what's going on and why some of the things I'm going to tell you uh, come out the way they are, this is the book. So I love this book. But careful, there is a long distance from there to an actual application. But it's, it's an awesome book. And this school, the school that these Swedish guys created, is essentially that's cool, just like Gauss in, in um, mathematics, in applied mathematics, these are the guys. And every descendant of them is doing amazing work and very solid. When it comes to numerical relativity itself, uh, luckily there are a number of books uh, that are available, no available nowadays, and they are mainly really useful. As long as you remember that most of the attention of the field nowadays is in computing gravitational waves for LIGOs and Virgos and Kagras. So there is, they are limited in the goal. In fact, they even, I would argue, one, like this, this book, which is very good, Numerical Relativity, Solving Einstein's Equations on the Computer by uh, Shapiro and Vangarde, they have the definition, Numerical Relativity is the art of solving Einstein's equations for astrophysics. Okay, that's just only a subset of what Numerical Relativity is. But again, these are very useful books. And if you're more interested in the ADS CFT applications, I, I would suggest it's very useful, very good review by Paul Chesler and, and Larry Yaffe. OK, so let's go now to trying to set uh, the groundwork for what we want to do. So we want to somehow solve that, solve that equation. So the first thing you need to do is, OK, what Understand what is the characteristics of the equations So what are the type of equations you'll be solving for depending on the problem you want to address? Uh, these equations if you're asking for the dynamical uh, the dynamic, dynamical problem, well, they will be hyperbolic. You know that behind these equations 
they are wave equations, so we're going to be studying those. But if you are trying to solve for a configuration of a stationary problem, well, the equations would be elliptic. So you first need to ask, what are the characteristics of the equations? And depending on the answer to that equation, to that question, uh, you have to choose different techniques. Uh, then is how you will discretize. And I'll talk a little, uh, a little bit about this uh, in today. Uh, so you also want to know what boundary or initial data you have to worry about. You might also have to worry about gauge issues, gauge or coordinate issues. Uh, whether you have a source, what are the characteristics of the source and the dynamics that govern the source. And finally, of course, you need to ask yourself the question, can I do this problem? Do they have the resources computationally to go and try uh, to solve this problem? And this is where I'm going to pause and I'm going to tell you something I tell, I always tell my uh, students who work with me is, never trust the result of a numerical whatever simulation in science. Why? I mean, unless it's been kind of corroborated later on by a follow-up work. The reason is often than not, more often than not, people are working at the bleeding edge of what you can do. And this is why there are many results that you have to be careful with. And it may be not necessarily the, the result that they have as far as the physics, but some of the ingredients that built, were built in, in there may have been a consequence of working with the bare minimum of resolution you could have. So just always come, come in with a, with a pinch of incredulity with respect to the work, and then see if there is a follow-up, or ask or check if the paper, the work, has enough of the things we're going to talk today to convince yourself that the result is trustable. So this is what we're going to do. So first thing is, so let's start here. Suppose, so for simplicity, we're going to assume now that we're dealing with wave equations. So first, let's talk about discretization. OK, the discretization will be turning your continuous problem into a discrete problem. For that, you're going to use some discretize, some way to make your continuous information into a set of discrete set of values. So for instance, if I have a function, whatever that is, I can choose to describe it in terms of values of the function at specific points, or I can turn it into a set of coefficients with respect to some, specific, some special functions. So for instance, if you're doing a decomposition of something in spherical harmonics, that's what you're doing. The coefficients are telling you how the form, whatever your thing is, or how it is uh, described in terms of this basis. This one, just set of set of individual points and the values they have in there. So it, Along these lines are words or, or techniques that come with these names, finite difference methods, finite vo volume methods, finite element methods. And I'll tell you a little bit about them as we go along. By and large, I'm going to be talking uh, mainly about this. If you decide. Uh, in the near future to do a numerical code, and you might talk with your, an engineering friend that you might have. That's a wrong thing to have. That's a wrong friend to have. But, um, but if you have one, um, they, and if that person happens to be working in some field, say hydrodynamics, um, it's, he or she is very worried about how a plane flies, and you tell them, oh, I'm using finer differences, they will laugh in your face. They say, well, you're using a technique from the 50s. OK, the, your counter is. I'm, in, I'm discovering physics. I'm discovering something new. You're just solving an old problem. For that, the, it, and this is actually true. If you're in discovery mode, you really don't know what the true best technique is. Finite differences is very, it's an easy technique in. It's very flexible, very malleable. Once you start solving problems that you have solved before, or you kind of, it's similar to something you have already encountered, other solution, other methods are better. Like, Finite elements, one of them. Spectral methods is another one. But you need to know where you're going, in particular spectral methods, 
will rely on you knowing the solution is sufficiently smooth, which is perfectly fine. And so you get significant gains in performance, but final difference is a, is a nice entry point. Uh, I do have some engineering friends, but anyway, so let's start with that. So I'm gonna be focusing mainly on this. Then, as I said, if you're gonna trust a numerical solution, you want to know if people have done or have strong evidence of the following, convergence, stability, and consistency. There is a theorem that in some good cases, two of these imply the third one in different orders, but let's talk about them individually. I'd rather uh, we know uh, more carefully what we're doing, um, and we ask that we check everything. So consistency just means if you discretize your problem in whatever technique you're using, for instance, this one, you have to make sure that you can prove rigorously, and this is usually very simple, um, that if you take the limit of your discretization to the continuum, and I'll show you some examples, you recover your original problem. Stability, I'll talk some more about that in detail, but basically we'll say, we'll say if you don't expect things to just blow up in your face, they shouldn't be blowing up in your face, but it's actually much more than that. And convergence, you need to tell me, or you need to show, that once you use any of these techniques that introduce some discretization length, either by the distance there are between points or the number of elements or bases that you're using, as you increase that to arbitrary large number of bases or arbitrary small spacing, um, you, re you have a good sense of how quickly you're approaching the true solution of your problem. Is this clear so far? So I'm just saying words, so I'm gonna start with some specific example. Uh, and then we're gonna go through those things as we go along. And in fact, what we're trying to build is something that is contained here, is that it's at least sufficient conditions for these three things to be satisfied. So at least we know if we do these, we can trust what we're doing. So first, let me just, okay, let's, let's, let's imagine that we're trying to discretize, I don't know, the function phi of x using finer differences. We're gonna imagine that we have a problem with a boundary. Then we're gonna have to ask what we're gonna do with the boundaries and how we implement those. But so suppose we do that, we imagine that we have a grid like so. For simplicity, we're gonna assume that the distance between the points is delta x. This is called a uniform grid. We're assuming that all spacing in between two points is always the same. And then we're gonna say that whatever this function is described by the values it has at those points. So we want to, we're gonna have phi of x. Now it's represented by phi i. And then we say, well, how do we take, for instance, if we have this equation, so let's, see, let's start with just that, which is called the advection equation. Uh, incidentally, let me just say something else. Any equation of this form, any solution for, the, for this equation is just any general function of the argument t plus x. So one thing we immediately see from here is that the speed at which information propagates is one, right? So if I have a t equal to zero, let's say this shape, at t equal one, we're gonna have this shape displaced only by one for this problem. So this is, is, it, is this clear? It's, I think it's sufficiently simple. So sorry if I'm going very low, just I can, I can speed up. Just. Um, that the speed at which things propagate will be crucial once we start talking about sufficient conditions for stability. So we need to keep that in mind. So now suppose we want to say, what's the approximation to the, this derivative? Well, one easy approximation is to say, well, it's a problem, say, at the point i. Uh, 
that's something you would have learned when you started kind of when your teacher in high school was trying to kind of hint you that there is a thing called calculus that we're, build, that we're gonna be able to do better before, uh, in the future. So this is an approximation. And you can ask, well, if I use Taylor, so now if you think back, using your continuous knowledge to describe your discrete information, then phi i plus one is given by phi i plus using Taylor, say f prime, at i times xi plus one minus xi, which happened to be delta, so I'm gonna put delta here, and fi minus one plus f prime i, and here is xi minus one minus x, which is minus delta. So if you will happily, easily convince yourself that you take this minus that divided by two delta, then you have an approximation to the derivative there. But of course, you have more stuff. The next term here is one half f double prime times delta square plus one half f double prime plus delta square and so on. And if you compute this difference, you're gonna see that what you have is d is, a, is equal to f prime plus, so let me change the notation, I'm gonna use dx for the discrete version, plus some error, so you're gonna, so you, if you use Taylor, then you can convince yourself that d of f at i, using this definition, is dx of f at i, plus some error that goes like delta squared. So that goes to our consistency requirement. We're just saying, if we take delta to zero, do we have this, this approximating what we wanted at the continuous level, and the answer is yes. This is a very specific choice. You could use more points, involve more functions, or more, value, more values of the, of the uh, field that you care, to do something that's higher and higher order. You could go to delta, square, delta cube, delta, whatever power you want. It will involve more calculations, it will involve a stencil that uh, has more points. So here, if I think of this is the point i, this is the point i plus one, i minus one, where it only involve these three points to compute the derivative. But with more information, we can do something more accurate. And in the limit that we use all possible information, we're making contact with the spectral methods because the spectral methods will use the whole value of the function to adjust what those, uh, obtain what those coefficients are. Depending on the type of problem you're solving, that's an advantage or it's a disadvantage. If you have something that is very smooth, that's great, but if you have something that has discontinuities, that can get you in trouble. And that has to do with these uh, other techniques, finite elements and fin finite volumes, are able to deal with these continuities in your, in your functions, but we're gonna uh, deal with that later. Okay, so I'm gonna, not gonna say anything more about this. I'll be touching uh, on and off, but this is to say, this was to give you an example that you need to make a decision how you're gonna discretize your problem, and based on that assumption, then you're gonna build up a recipe of how to go forward. And we're, I'm gonna tell you Again, these sufficient conditions uh, that will expedite that work. So now let me do something else. Uh, oh, there it goes, okay. So we want a criteria, so physics implies, if we do physics, classical physics at least, the concept of well-posedness, which a mathematic, mathematicians call Hadamard, kind of translated into mathematical kind of rigor uh, in the following way. So well a problem that will be well-posed if it satisfies three conditions. Existence of solution. Solution is unique.
And three, the solution is continuous dependent on the initial data, or initial and boundary data. So of course, the first two are obvious. So if you're trying to solve a problem in physics, it better be that there is a solution. It also better be that the solution is unique. There is a sense that if I specify my initial conditions and my boundary conditions, I'm gonna get a single solution. Physics uh, is determined from that point of view. And also, it better be continuously dependent on the initial data and boundary data. So what does that mean? It means that well, it's a reminder that in physics, we never control the experiment to arbitrary accuracy, even the value of phi. So for a mathematician, it's an infinite number. Uh, for us, it's whatever you can measure, as long as you can measure this, whatever, the circumference of your, of your disk, you divide by the diameter, you define pi that way, but there's always some limit to the accuracy you can do that experiment. So it better be that the solution that you find that should be unique doesn't depend very sensitively on how good your approximation to that initial condition is. In mathematical terms, especially in, evolution, in, in the case of evolution, this means the following. Given a norm of the solution, let me call it phi again because we're using phi, at time t should be bounded by something so let's call it the value of the function at the initial time times potentially an exponential and an arbitrary factor, okay? Depending on the problem, we were able to estimate what those are. But these conditions imply or require that neither, sorry, this is called alpha, neither alpha nor beta depend on the initial data. I, that's the sensitivity. So we're gonna allow, if we give initial conditions for our problem, it better be that, okay, the solution can diverge, can blow up to infinity. In fact, if we were able, if we were solving this problem, let's call d phi dt equal lambda phi for lambda positive, phi would be blowing up exponentially, but it better be that this exponential rate does not depend on the initial condition I gave, because otherwise we can have wild departures of the solution for the different conditions that are however arbitrary close. So pictorially what this means is the following. If, if this is the configuration of space of the solution to the problem that we're trying to get, if we have initial data here, that the solution should be there, let's say, and if we give initial data that is slightly away from it with some epsilon, we are gonna allow this thing to go arbitrarily far if you want, but it's such that if I take epsilon to zero, so if I bring this point to here, this point should also come to that one. Okay, so that's just an obvious, uh, if you want, statement, but in physics that's what we require, and I'll show you explicitly Examples of how you can turn your numerical problem, even though your problem is well posed, once you do it at the discrete level, you can completely break this if you're not doing things carefully. Yes? Chaotic systems all fit into this, this uh, condition? Most chaotic conditions, yeah. So what, it, what they have is extreme, if you want, extreme sensitivity to how different your initial conditions are, but if you still collapse epsilon to zero, it still comes back. So chaotic systems will have, if you want, unfortunately, this factor being very, very large and positive, so it could just widely uh, deviate. But again, if you adjust the system so that it goes all the way, uh, then it's fine. Of course, again, once you do the, pro the experiment, because of the unfortunate fact that you can never prepare the experiment with exactly the same conditions arbit without to arbitrary accuracy, you're gonna be li uh, likely to see this. Good question, any other question? Okay, so I'm gonna go back and remember that problem. Yes. Yes, right. Yeah, so for instance, we could be solving this problem, right? But, and I'm, I'm, I'm give you, I'll give you an example, and this is extremely relevant for the case of beyond generativity theories. In fact, the theory that you just saw 
uh, the very last kind of uh, things that Claudia was talking about is a theory like that. It is at the mathematical level, under this definition, rigorously mathematical nonsense. Okay, the problem is that this is where physics and mathematics collide. We want to do something else, so how do we do that? The problem is, in, if that is that, well, let me, I'm gonna go into that tangent, um, is that this definition says, you can go with arbitrarily, arbitrarily short wavelengths. So it go to arbitrarily short wavelengths, and typically that's the problem. As you go to the UV, it's gonna be harder and harder to ensure that it's satisfied, and so this is why we're gonna have a whole set of conditions that we want to make sure they are satisfied. But if you do that, you get away from the EFT regime that you assume to work it out in the, to work this theory in the first case. So there is a there is a collision, there's a tension on what you do and what the mathematical knowledge is saying. So we have to be very careful how to address that. And so I'll I'll give you some examples as we maybe in the third or fourth lecture, of how we in practice have to deal with that. Uh, where was it going? Okay, so let me go back to our equation. So first thing, and the joke, I'll give you a joke. If you go to that book, Time-Dependent Problems, they keep solving this problem over and over and over. And uh, let's see, Christ used to own a little island in Sweden. And so I think his brother used to joke to him, I said, wow, just solving that little equation, you got an island. If you had been dealing with a much better equation, much more general equation, maybe you own Sweden. But there is a reason why we're gonna be looking into this. So first, let's imagine that we're dealing with hyperbolic problems of whatever order. So my claim is for any problem that is hyperbolic, we're always gonna end up solving this problem. So let's try and, and argue that this is true. So imagine first that I'm dealing with this problem. And this is why, even though this is the advection equation, people often call it also the wave equation. And this is because as you reduce this one, you're gonna end up there. So imagine that I'm here, and I'm gonna introduce two variables, f that is phi comma x, and pi that is phi comma t. So in terms of now, f and pi, what I have is the following system. So our original problem that had a single function with second, time, second derivatives is equivalent to this problem that has three variables now with only first derivatives. The reason we're going there is because there is a lot of rigor, there is a lot of rigorous theory and techniques that have been developed for the first order problem. So we're gonna, I'm slowly walking you towards in that direction. That is not to say that there isn't enough in the second, or with second order or higher, but because we can reduce to first order and there is a lot being done there, this is why I'm, I'm moving you in that direction. So one thing we know and love or hate about this equation is that we know that the speed of propagations are plus and minus one. So okay, where did that go? Another thing we know that this, so the, plus, the speed of propagations are plus minus one. We have two boundary conditions to give. When I come in here, I see three equations. Um, where, are the, where are the speed of propagations? We need to work them out, and we have to be careful with the boundary conditions. I see, in principle, well, I have three, how am I gonna, do I need to give three pieces of information or not? Yes? So that's yes, sorry. Uh, this, yes. This is because I often give this example with G. Sorry, exactly, thank you. Um, so first thing first, let me just give you a very obvious observation. If you add and subtract these two equations, you're gonna have f plus g, oh sorry, f plus pi comma t is equal f plus pi comma x. f minus pi comma t, f minus pi comma x with a minus sign in front. Okay, that's where the plus minus one went. So. Once we introduce this, 
In this way, the speed of propagations are hidden in combinations of these. So it is the case that some combinations of variables will have some things ex more explicitly, explicitly given by uh, than others. But rigorously, there is, we can talk about this in general. And the boundary conditions, this is what we're going to be going next. Um, so first thing first, and it's related to this. Remember, we discussed that if we have this equation, the solution was of the form f t plus x, which basically says if I had initial shape, at a later time, that shape moves to the left by whatever that time was. And if I have this R equation, the solution is some now t minus x. So that moves to the right. So if I have a plus sign here, it moves to the left. If I have a minus sign, it moves to the right. And if I have a value, call it lambda plus here, it moves with the speed given by that lambda plus or lambda minus. So now we're slowly building towards a more general condition that will teach us about general propagation speeds. I'll say some more things about these speeds, where they're constant or not as we go along. This will, crucially, will be crucially different between dealing with, say, Einstein equations as opposed to relativistic hydrodynamics. But for the moment, let's keep it this simple. So what we did here is something that we can do in general. So imagine I have now, and you'll see why as we go along, I have now many more variables. So let's pack them into some field u, which could be, in this case, phi, f, and pi, but however many we have. And I'll tell you why later on we'll see this will be, say, all the different components of the uh, metric tensor. So the equation of motion might be generically of the form, of this, this form. So I promise you can write it this way and we'll show one explicit example later. So here I can have all my unknowns. My, it will be a matrix where this index runs over the number of spatial variable, the spatial directions that I have. So this would be, say if I'm using Cartesian, x dx, dy dz. And everything else that doesn't have any differentiation, I'll lump it into something else. These are called lower order terms. Again, I will, we'll discuss specific, a specific example later on. So if you have that, for the time being, let me think that we're just one plus one dimensions, or there's only one derivative in non-trivial. So let's think about u comma t equal a dx of u plus b of u. Now, we're in the hyperbolic, this hyperbolic regime. Um, the hyperbolic regime will have a property associated to it that the eigenvalues of this matrix will be uh, real. Again, let me just give you an example of why we care about that. Suppose I have this one. Suppose I'm dealing with that equation. I threw in just an i there. And now let's use a very simple Fourier decomposition of, for try, trying to do this, find the solution to this problem. So I'm going to say that phi of t and x is some e to the st times e to the ikx, with some factor here that I don't care. If I replace, replace this in here, I'm going to have an s coming from the derivative of the e to the st. I'll have an i, and I'll have an ik coming from the spatial derivative of this, this guy. So what I find out is that the solution will be some coefficient times some i minus kt times ikx, right? I haven't yet said what that k is. It's a wave number. That wave number can be positive or negative. So I immediately see here that if k is negative, this is blowing up in my face. And if I ask what's the norm of phi, 
at time t, well, will be given by the norm of this one, this is 1, will be some a, and this will be e to the minus kt. For k negative, this is blowing up. Worse yet, it's blowing up with a k that is the wave number of that particular mode. And since I can put any wave number I want, if I put k very, very large, i.e. my wavelength is arbitrarily small, this thing is blowing up at arbitrary rates. And therefore, it's violating that Hadamard condition we had. So this is an example of a nil post problem, something that if you see it, you should run away from. Is, it, is this clear? And if you're not going to run away from, you better know what you're doing. And this has to do with the comment that I had before to the type of theories you saw at the end of Claudia's lecture. So we need to do something special with that. So the basic conditions for first order problems, uh, for pro hyperbolic problems written in first order form, is that the eigenvalues be all real. We're going to keep adding more and more conditions as we go along. Yes, OK, thank you. So the question was, I saw this because I solved the equation. Yes. Right, good. That's an excellent question. You can always solve it locally just by saying, OK, I introduced a description in terms of Fourier modes of my solution in, around this point. And then I ask, what is my equation saying about how it should peel off from there? And you are going to obtain this. So this is, I didn't have to solve the equation. This is informally. I'm saying locally, I can always make this argument. And this argument is usually referred to as the high frequency limit analysis of your, of your problem. And, and this is why you can draw that general conclusion is if the eigenvalues of this matrix, if any eigenvalue of this matrix happen to, be, happen to have a, an imaginary part, then you're doomed from the start. So you either have to fix it somehow with a good reason, or I guarantee I bet my house to a dime that your problem would blow up. There's nothing you can do. Again, in, uh, in, in, in some papers, you would have seen, oh, my, I can run for a while, my problem doesn't blow up. I said, oh, but that's because you haven't done convergence. If you do convergence, you need to incre increase the number of points. And you agree, then you're going to see that your solution keeps changing and gets differs more and more as you reduce the discretization length. Is that clear? Have another question? Yeah. If you don't have K modes, with, with what, sorry? Oh, excellent question. The point is, again, you need to tell me, you need to convince me that your code is convergent. The only way you're going to convince me is to take the limit to the continuum. As you take the limit to the continuum, you're going to explore arbitrary high frequencies, uh, arbitrary short wavelengths. That's because that's how we started. We started from a continuous problem, and we, by fiat, we introduce a, a particular length. OK, the problem should not depend on that length. I should be able to do a better and better job. And the idea is that, OK, a very simple thing. Of course, I can have a circle and approximate it by whatever, a Swiss flag. Uh, but then I can do better on the Swiss flag, right? I can add more and more edges and make it more and more rounded. It shouldn't be that my solution requires me that the circle be represented by a Swiss flag. Um, and if I change it to something better, it goes, it goes all right. Thank you. OK, so let me make that last connection. So we're, we're now keep thinking about this. And I'm, notice I'm saying almost nothing about that B. And again, oh, oh, thank you. And I'm not saying anything, not, I'm not saying much about this B because of what I'm about to say now. So let me just say a few more things. Okay, if we remember our linear algebra problem, we say let's suppose there exists a matrix P that transforms my A into, a, into its Jordan form. We know we can do that, at least locally. At some moment of time, at some place in, uh, in space, I can do it. So there exists a P such that P to the minus I, one AP 
is my Jordan matrix. So that Jordan matrix can be just purely diagonal or it can have some ones on top. So let me just play around with this. I'm gonna throw in a P to the minus one and a P here, but of course I don't wanna be changing my problem, so I'm also throwing a P to the minus one here. So this P and P minus one gives me the identity. I haven't done anything. I also throw it here. P, P minus one, that's my identity. So, so far it's the same problem. Now I want to do is act to the left, act on the left by P to the minus one. So when I, and I'm gonna ignore this for the time being. This will give me P to the minus one, U comma T. The P to the minus one acting on the P gives me nothing, so it leaves P minus one AP, P minus one UX, plus the rest. I mean, the reason I'm ignoring it, or the, the, the fact that I keep ignoring it is already hinting you that the end is not gonna matter if we're in the right regime. The last thing I can do is just realize, oh, I have P to the minus one of my variable U with any derivative. I can replace this by P to the minus one U with that derivative plus something else that has to do with the derivative of this P to the minus one uh, with respect to that index. Again, the reason I'm not going very much into detail is because it won't matter. So using this, I can say, oh, P to the minus one acting on U, and let me call it V. So this will be V comma T. This P minus one AP is my Jordan matrix, or my Jordan form. And then I see here, again, P minus one U, I can replace it by the derivative of the combination, which happens to be V, sorry, V comma I plus more stuff, plus a new rest, which now involves the derivatives of this P, but U comes if undifferentiated. So here I see, I might see P, but I see U. And if I see U, it's the same as C in V, undifferentiated. So this is the main line we were, going, we're going to get. We are able to, if we have a problem of that type, we're able to reduce it to a problem that happens to be like so. V to comma T is some Jordan, some matrix times V comma X, plus something that doesn't have uh, any rest. So here's where the theorem comes. If the Jordan form is diagonal, and all lambdas are real. So that's a theorem. Of course, I, I, mathematicians will not like me calling your golden here, but that's what, I, what you mean, or what, that's the, the important thing. If this matrix happens to be diagonal, you gain a heck, heck of a lot of the same, the same things at the same time. So first, you're gonna have lambda one, lambda n. If they are all real, this piece just gives you a collection of 1D wave equations, or the, of the advection equations. This will just turn into vi comma t equal lambda i vi comma x. Right, because this is diagonal, they are uncoupled whereas from that point of view. Yes, we have the rest here, but the theorem also tells you all the nice properties you're gaining because of the diagonal will not be spoiled by this thing. This adds, just adds some nuisance, but by and large, you get everything. By requiring that all these are real, we know we're, we're, we're at least not in the, Ill, surely you're in post condition. And what this theorem just tells you, when it says you're golden, it says at once, your problem will be well posed, regardless of this rest, this rest stuff that we haven't analyzed, regardless on the fact that they have assumed that here I'm local, I mean, these A's can be dependent on the U themselves. So regardless of that, 
So it's as good as you can get if you satisfy that condition. So if you're dealing with a hyperbolic problem, the very first question you're going to have to ask is, can I satisfy this theorem? If you can satisfy this theorem, you are in the perfect shape to try and do numerical simulations. And if the numerical simulation fails, it's probably something else you mess up with, maybe in the particular discretization, in the way you coded up your problem, or whatever, because you're, you're starting with the most solid foundation you can have. This theorem, I stress again, is a sufficient condition. It's not necessary. You could have a problem where you don't satisfy all these, um, that the, the Jordan form is purely diagonal, so it has no ones, but that uh, is rare. In fact, I can give you a very simple example. You can take this problem, let's call it u comma t, Suppose you have that, u comma t equal u comma x, our advection equation, v comma t, v comma x plus u comma x. So if we write it in this form, we would be saying u v comma t is a matrix that based on this is one, zero, one, one. We don't have, the matrix is constant coefficients. We don't have any rest. We have eigenvalues are real, so we're almost hitting all the right nodes. The Jordan form, unfortunately, is not purely diagonal. We have this one. If you study this problem, this problem is going to be fine. You can prove well poseness. There is a norm that you can show it's going to be fine. But what you can show is that if you have any rest in here that depends on u and v, you're done. The problem becomes ill pose. So it's very rare that something that, does, that has a Jordan form with uh, off diagonal terms, even when the real, even when all the eigenvalues are real, will give you a well posed problem. There are examples, but it, it's rare. Um, for that reason, so if all the eigenvalues are real, but you have off diagonal terms, This is, it's, the system is referred to be a, as weakly hyperbolic. And if you're in weakly hyperbolic, basically, you're on your own. Very careful, there might be cases where it works fine, or in general, it would be bad. If you remember your linear algebra course, courses, you, would rem you may remember that off diagonal terms means that the repeated eigenvalues do not span the subspace, so you have a degenerate subspace. So the, the theorem sometimes is says that if you have degenerate eigenvalues, but real, you're weakly hyperbolic. Uh, I think this is time to stop. Any questions? If not, I'll stop here. We'll resume later today and then we're going, to be, we're going to be discussing how we take this one and move it to the GR problem. Because after all, this is just completely general. Thank you.